Kia ora everybody, this is the tutorial video for the close analysis of the poem Medusa by Carol Ann Duffy. So this is for Year 13 English in Ms Hope's class. So for this particular tutorial, you're going to need a couple of things to do this properly. You're going to need a copy of Medusa, the poem, um, so you can either use this on your own paper copy if you have it, if you prefer to work on paper, um, or you can open up the week six lockdown assignment and there's a copy of the poem all set up there for you to do the analysis. Um, if you're using paper, you'll need a selection of highlighters, ideally around five colors so you can annotate as we go. So what we're going to do is I am going to take you through stanza by stanza analysis of the poem in quite a lot of detail um, and I'm going to explain you know explain to you more than what's written down on the page um, because the idea is that I'm talking you through the analysis as if we were in class. Um, so what you will need to do is as we're going through you'll need to pause the visit video at certain times so you have time to highlight the right parts and take down your notes and listen to what I'm saying. You don't have to write down absolutely everything that I've written down but you should highlight all the different elements of the language that's working together because this is what you'll use um, for then writing essays about the poetry if, you, if you're going to do that. Um, just a quick disclaimer that the highlighter colours between each of the slides do not correlate between the stanzas. Um, that, what I mean by that is that on the first slide in stanza one, yellow might be to identify an illusion, but then on slide two for stanza two, it might be yellow might be identifying a metaphor. Um, so that's just because I have a very limited number of colours through PowerPoint. That's really the only reason. Okay. Um, if you've got a better system, you go for it, but um, this is the only way I could do it. Um, and lastly, before we get started, I want you to recognise that the way I've analysed this poem is exactly how I do it, you know, in quote-unquote real life, when I sit down and get out a poem and go, okay, how am I going to work to understand this text? The way I highlight and the way I annotate is very true to the actual process of me annotating a text. Obviously I've picked particular parts out to talk to you about because it works with our unit, um, but this is very real in terms of the way you analyse poetry and it's how I learned to do it in university. So let's get started. Let's firstly have a read through the poem to remind ourselves. A suspicion, a doubt, a jealousy grew in my mind, which turned the hairs on my head to filthy snakes, as though my thoughts hissed and spat on my scalp. My bride's breath soured, stank in the grey bags of my lungs. I'm foul-mouthed now, foul-tongued, yellow-fanged. There are bullet tears in my eyes. Are you terrified? Be terrified. It's you I love perfect man, Greek god, my own, but I know you'll go, betray me, stray from home, so better be for me if you were stone. I glanced at a buzzing bee, a dull grey pebble fell to the ground. I glanced at a singing bird, a handful of dusty gravel spattered down. I looked at a ginger cat, a house brick shattered a bowl of milk. I looked at a snuffling pig, a boulder rolled in a heap of shit. I stared in the mirror. Love gone bad showed me a gorgon. I stared at a dragon. Fire spewed from the mouth of a mountain. And here you come with a shield for a heart and a sword for a tongue and your girls, your girls. Wasn't I beautiful? Wasn't I fragrant and young? Look at me now. So let's get started with this analysis. This is stanza one. Remember, it would be good to pause the video so you can take the highlighting and the notes um, at whatever point you need to. So stanza one, a suspicion, a doubt, a jealousy grew in my mind, which turned the hairs on my head to filthy snakes as though my thoughts hissed and spat on my scalp. Well, first of all, in the yellow, we've got this allusion, a reference to the original myth, 
that's obvious, right? Duffy's chosen to open the poem with a direct reference to the original myth with um, snakes as hair, right? So it's really obvious who the text is about. Um, in the pink here, we have this negative, violent imagery, which turned the hairs on my head to filthy snakes, as though my thoughts hissed and spat on my scalp. So that, to me, she's really identifying herself with these nasty, ugly, threatening characteristics. Um, this is how she's seen. The, the words that we use to describe something in ourselves tell us how we feel about it. So filthy, hissed, and spat are, um, are nasty, are ugly, almost animal, right? They're not very human. Um, and there's this, this word grew, this diction, so word choice, a suspicion, a doubt, a jealousy grew in my mind. That's really giving us the impression that there's been a slow change, like a development. Um, there hasn't, there's nothing sort of instantaneous about what she's talking about or how she's experiencing it. It, it wasn't overnight. How she's feeling about herself um, has been a process and, and it has taken time. So it implies some change, which also foreshadows the rest of the poem, which I'm going to talk about later. And then there are these personal pronouns that grew in my mind, which turn the heads on my head to filthy snakes, my thoughts, my scalp. She's really speaking for herself here, right? So first of all, we have that element of the character finally telling her own story, which is that element of feminist revisionism that we've been talking about. So she's telling her story, but she's also these negative and violent animalistic words that she's using it's implying that she feels that way about herself because she's saying these are my thoughts on my scalp. Um, so it gives us the impression that this is how she feels about herself at the start of the text. Okay, So she's feeling the way she looks in a sense. So stanza two, my bride's breath soured, stank in the grey bags of my lungs. I'm foul-mouthed now, foul-tongued, yellow-fanged. There are bullet tears in my eyes. Are you terrified? So again, similar to the previous stanza, we have these same personal pronouns. She's still telling her own story. She, this is the way she feels about herself. So my, my, I'm, my eyes, all those things. Um, this bride's breath soured and stank. Um, I've identified that as a metaphor. So she's referring to her bride's breath. That's referring to virginity. So remember, in the original story, um, Medusa was a beautiful woman and she was raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple. And um, then that, and he took her virginity from her. Um, and that word soured really implies something rotten or not wanted or kind of destroyed. So she's she's really implying that her her person, her womanhood is is destroyed. It's it's rotten, it's off, nobody's gonna want it, which is drawing that parallel historically between virginity and women's value. Um, so she's still valuing herself to that. So she herself thinks she's worthless because she's saying my bride's breath soured and stank. Um, there's this I'm foul mouthed now, foul tongued, yellow fanged, this sort of diction, so particular word choice mixed with this imagery of yellow fanged and this kind of nastiness. She's identifying herself by her physical aspects. Okay. So foul mouthed, so how she how she looks, how she sounds. Um, which is drawing importance to image and beauty. She's this. She's identifying herself by her physical characteristics, which are monstrous and ugly in her mind. Um, so she's she's really identifying herself by the physical and what she looks like. Again, drawing importance to that, drawing connection to that importance of appearance for women. 
Um, there's also this illusion here. There are bullet tears in my eyes, so a direct reference to the myth of Medusa turning living things to stone by looking at them. Um, and it's interesting that she sort of said that, like, there are bullet tears, so bullets being like a weapon, um, and her uh, tears referring to her eyes, so her eyes are her weapon in, in this. So it's, it's an interesting way to phrase it. But on top of that, we have this diction mixed, mixed with passive voice. There are bullet tears in my eyes. What I mean by that is that there's a sense of like a lack of ownership on her part. Like this is happening to her against her will. She doesn't want it. She's not saying my eyes are my weapons or my eyes are weapons or my eyes are dangerous or anything like that. She's saying there are bullet tears in my eyes so there's a lack of ownership there she doesn't want this happening to her and that's really important because that then changes later on in the poem but at the moment it's really clear that she doesn't want this process happening to her and the stanza ends with this rhetorical question are you terrified this could be quite like almost quite threatening, like an expectation that we should be terrified of her, assuming that she's speaking directly to the reader. I think she is at this point. She's just speaking generally. Um, she assumes that we are frightened of her monstrous form. Um, so she's again, she's saying, this is what I look like, therefore people are going to be horrified by me. She has that expectation because that's the expectation that's been taught to her, as well we know. Stanza three, be terrified. So in response to that previous rhetorical question, be terrified. It's you I love, perfect man, Greek god, my own. But I know you'll go, betray me, stray from home. So better be for me if you were stone. So this in the green here, this be terrified, like that's an imperative. It's it's not a question. It's not a suggestion. It's telling somebody something, which really to me sounds like a direct threat. But who exactly should be terrified here? Who is being threatened in this moment? Is it us or is it the person that she di directly addresses next? That's up for interpretation. In the blue here, there's this, it's you I love, perfect man, Greek god, my own, but I know you'll go, betray me, stray from home. So that's uh, the myth, the direct allusion reference to the myth. Um, so she's talking specifically about Poseidon, um, who, based on different versions of the myth, she did love or she maybe had a relationship with, possibly, um, and then he attacked her. So perhaps she did love him before he was the cause of her punishment from Athena. Um, perfect man, Greek god, my own, but I know you'll go betray me straight from home. Could, it's possible that she could be maybe trying to lure him back in to maybe get revenge. Like We know that she's hurt and she's angry. So perhaps she's not being sarcastic, but maybe trying to lure him back because she wants her revenge, possibly, um, because I don't really buy that she would still love him after this. I don't think Carol Ann Duffy would be presenting that idea, so I'm looking for something else. And there's this tone in here, but I know you'll go betray me straight from home. There's almost a sense of, like, of, of jealousy or she, she's angry she's upset she's speaking from experience right Poseidon did what he did and then left her and left her to take Athena's punishment so perhaps this is there to show that her anger is justified we we understand why she's feeling angry and resentful um, as the reader so it's not an unjustified feeling that she has which again we only know based on hearing her side of the story. Um, so again, the importance of that revisionism. 
And the last line, so better be for me if you were stone. So I think there's a real tone here. There's a very decisive tone to this line. It's like she's kind of growing in her power or her strength. Um, she's acknowledging the power as almost a positive, so she can turn things to stone, as we learned in the previous stanza. Um, and she's almost like acknowledging that now and saying she might use it, kind of like a threat again. I, and I think this lure is, she's talking directly to Poseidon and this connects well with that luring him in. She wants him to suffer. She wants revenge. Um, and we know now that what, what we know about her and her story, that is justified. Um, so it's just this small hint of a tone change um, growing, her kind of developing this power and strength and how she feels about herself. Just that first small hint of it. And stanza four. I glanced at a buzzing bee. A dull grey pebble fell to the ground. I glanced at a singing bird. A handful of dusty gravel spattered down. So We've got the personal pronouns again, but they're a little bit different in this part of the poem. There's a real ownership of her actions. She's saying, I glanced, I glanced, I did this, I did this. So instead of talking about what she looks like or, you know, her yellow fangs or whatever, she's focusing now more on her actions rather than her appearance. So there's a there's a slight shift in what she's focusing on. Um, and the words glanced here is, I think it's an important element of diction of word choice because to glance at something is not a direct purposeful action. It's almost an accident. It's like a lack of control. Like you're looking around and glance at something nonchalantly. So it's not a purposeful action at this point. Um, she's not totally in control. And there's a reference to these animals. So I glanced at a buzzing bee and I glanced at a singing bird. Um, this is to set up contrast in the next few stanzas. But those, a bee and a bird, small creatures of very little significance, right? Um, not dangerous or threatening, just two things that kind of exist. Could be some kind of reference to the birds and the bees. I don't know, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. Um, but that's an interesting choice either way. So two kind of non, non-threatening animals that she's seen. And then there's this contrast, right? Because you've got this a buzzy bee, a dull grey pebble fell to the ground. So she kind of accidentally looks at this bee and it turns into a tiny rock that just falls down. And she again glances accidentally at a singing bird and it just turns into this dust of this kind of handful of gravel that just spatters down, that just falls down. Um, so there's this real contrast of kind of cute and lively and beautiful like buzzing bee and singing bird with this very dull and dead grey pebble, dusty gravel. So this real contrast of of those two things that um really i think suggests like she's she's not in the best state of mind she doesn't want to see these like really pretty beautiful things and moving forward for stanza five there's even more of a development here in in her power and her actions i looked at a ginger cat a house brick shattered a bowl of milk. I looked at a snuffling pig, a boulder rolled in a heap of shit. So again, there's that repetition of the structure in those personal pronouns, I looked, I looked. So again, still focusing on her actions rather than her appearance, similar to the previous stanza. And there's an interesting change in the diction here. The previous stanza, it was I glanced. This stanza is I looked. So that's more purposeful. Actively looking at something is different to just glancing at it. So there's more purpose to her actions. Perhaps she's gaining more control 
of what she's doing. She's more active in what she's doing. And the animals represented here, the ginger cat and the snuffling pig. So the animals are getting bigger, right? So a bee and a bird, slightly, you know, smaller and less kind of in the way than a cat and a pig. So those animals are getting bigger, as is her awareness of her power and her control over it, right? So she's she accidentally turned a bee and a bird into stone. So now, well, maybe I'm going to actively try, what about this cat? What about this pig? They're a bit bigger. Oh, that I can also turn those to stone. So she's got some more control and more awareness of what she can do. Um, and there is still this negative imagery of a house brick shattered a bowl of milk and a boulder rolled in a heap of shit. Um, but the tone is a little bit different here to the different stanzas. When you look at the idea of the growing power and control that she's having, like we've already analysed, there's almost a sense of pride here in what she can do. So a house brick shattered a bowl of milk and a boulder rolled in a heap of shit. So I think there's, there's a more prideful tone here that she's she's not as embarrassed as she was or ashamed of what she looked like, like she was in the start of the poem. It has developed into, well, this is what I can do. I have some strength. I have some power. And stanza six, in the, again, the same structure. I stared in the mirror. Love gone bad showed me a gorgon. I stared at a dragon. Fire spewed from the mouth of a mountain. Um, so the personal pronouns here, the I, 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 is repeating still. But I think in this stanza, coupled with everything else, the tone has more pride and strength. This is like a brag now, right? It's not just like, this is what I did. It's like, this is what I can do. So she's really growing in the sense of accomplishment, like, this is what I can do. And that, I get that from coupling it with the diction of stared here, right? So originally it was, I glanced, then it was, I looked, and now it's, I stared. So there is active control and power over her actions in that word stared. She has t regained total control of her person and can now actively do what she wants to do with, with purpose. Um, so it's, it's, you we've, can see that real change and development of um, sense of pride in herself and her actions and what she's capable of. And this line here, love gone bad showed me a gorgon, that's um, a separate allusion, so a reference to the myth. Um, so love gone bad, so Poseidon raping her, has caused her to become this monster. So love gone bad showed me a gorgon. I'm going to talk about gorgon in a minute. She, so she blames him, this love gone bad. She blames that situation on what she has become. Um, but there's a real contrast to the start of the poem where she was ashamed of herself and what she had become. So it's like the the tone and the, the purpose of the poem has shifted to being ashamed of what she looks like to acknowledging this is who has done this to me. So um, shifting shifting the blame almost. And that specific word gorgon, so the use of the word gorgon, that's diction, word choice, that um, from Greek mythology, that's a type of creature that Medusa was. So Medusa was her name, and the creature that she was, was um, a gorgon, right? That's what the ancient Greeks called that particular creature, that particular monster. So what's interesting is that she's now identified herself with the specific title and name. It's got a capital G, so it's a title. Um, there's a real sense of pride there, of ownership of, well, because in mythology, that's a well-known creature. So she's 
she's identifying herself as something something that is powerful and is to be feared um so she's labeling herself this is how she's identifying herself no longer this bride's breath soured woman but this this monster this creature that is mythological and powerful um and again the final kind of animal that she's referring to I stared at a dragon, fire spewed from the mouth of a mountain. So she's so powerful that she stared directly at this dragon, this other mythological creature, and she can transform that huge creature to stone, which is what fire spewed from the mouth of a mountain. So she's turned this dragon to stone and it's become this mountain. And now she's really aware of the extent of her power and her strength so what she can do she started just by accidentally looking at this bee thing and now she can turn entire huge creatures to stone so she has a title she is aware of her power and she's proud of it because she's staring at it she knows what she can do and finally in stanza seven to finish off the poem and here you come with a shield for a heart and a sword for a tongue and your girls, your girls. Wasn't I beautiful? Wasn't I fragrant and young? Look at me now. So this is an interesting, um, interesting part, I think, because th this is a direct address, right? She's, and here you come and your girls, your girls. The question really is, who is she addressing in this moment? Perhaps she's addressing... Perseus, um, who was the Greek hero who came to um, fight her and cut off her head in the original myth, um, so he eventually beheaded her, so maybe she's directly addressing him, and here you come, that would make sense with the original story. Um, and there's this definite metaphor, a sword for a tongue. Um, I think that could imply the hurt or damage that words or labels can cause. So if a tongue meaning like words or speaking and a sword being a weapon, so words being a weapon to hurt or damage, um, like the hurt she first experienced being labeled a monster. Remember at the beginning of the poem, she was ashamed of herself and what she looked like. Um, so perhaps she's drawing attention to the way that men or not all men obviously but the patriarchy in a sense um, can label women as particular things that are damaging um, and misrepresent them and I think there's if, if we go with the Perseus thing I think this your girls your girls has it's like an allusion to the myth and there's this interesting contrast here so I think that's referencing Perseus coming to behead her to impress the woman he loved. That's part of the original myth is that Perseus fell in love with this princess and to impress her, he was like, well, I'm going to go cut the head off this ugly monster to impress you. Um, so perhaps that's what Medusa is referring to. Um, but it's also kind of contrasting saying girls is very belittling and very... Um, condescending and maybe she's contrasting that with herself like she's like your girls your girls but I'm not one of those girls I'm a gorgon I'm powerful um I'm I'm grown right I'm whole um she's no longer just this bride right somebody's thing somebody's girl from the start of the poem she is so much more powerful now. So perhaps that's um, sort of contrasting from the beginning of the poem to how she saw herself versus how she sees herself now. In this rhetorical question, wasn't I beautiful? Wasn't I fragrant and young? I get the sense that she's almost mocking him or us. Um, she's being sort of sarcastic. Like maybe she's almost making fun of the fact that she used to feel that being beautiful was important. Um, 
whereas now she places her worth in her power and the way that she controls herself. So perhaps she's almost being a little bit sarcastic of, remember when I thought this was important? Well, it's really not because this is what I can do now. Maybe. And finally, the poem finishes with this imperative, which I think is really important because an imperative is telling someone to do something. The speaker has control. Um, so this look at me now is, it's, it's, that's really nice because it, it refers to the previous line of wasn't I fragrant and young, look at me now, look at how I've changed, but also that I dare you to look at me, like I dare you to challenge my power. Um, and she wants people to look at her. She's not, she's not ashamed of her filthy snakes or her yellow fangs. She doesn't care about that now, which really contrasts to the beginning of the poem. Whereas now we have the sense of pride, strength, ownership. Her focus is on what she can do as opposed to what she looks like and what's happened to her. So there's this real shift in tone throughout the poem and obviously it depends on how you interpret and how you read the text as a whole but I think the text shows this change and development in her character and her understanding that she doesn't have to conform to what she's being told to conform to she, she can create her own narrative which in the end is what feminist revisionism and representation is all about.